Hello? Thank you. Um, yes, well, I was born completely colorblind, so I've never seen a color. I don't know what blue looks like or what yellow looks like. So as a child, I tried to ignore the existence of color, but it was really difficult because uh, people who see color uh, always mentioning it. it in every single day, I could hear the names of color in daily conversations and in daily elements that usually have nothing to do with the beauty of color. Things like yellow pages or blue tack or Bluetooth or orange or red cross contain the names of colors. Red Bull, Pink Panther, uh, the green card, um, James Brown, the green land. So I kept hearing names of colors every day. So it was impossible for me to ignore color. Also when color is used as a code, it can be a bit confusing. Sometimes hot water and cold water is only expressed through color. Also maps sometimes only use color codes. Uh, this is Tokyo, so it's a bit confusing if you don't see color. Also, when I was trying to learn the colors of flags, I had uh, this situation where three countries share exactly the same flag. And when I was talking to people, it was also a bit confusing. If someone would ask me, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes and dressed in pink? I would have absolutely no idea because the only information I get here is that the man has hair, that he has eyes and that he's not naked, basically. So the reason why I wanted to sense college is because it's a social element. I didn't want to change my sight. I like seeing in grayscale. It has many advantages. I have better night vision, for example. I can see longer distances. I can memorize shapes more easily because color doesn't distract me from uh, detecting the shape. I can also detect camouflages more easily because many camouflages are based on color. And also photocopies are cheaper in black and white. So this was always an advantage. So I didn't want to change my sight but I wanted to have a sense of color. That's why I wanted to create a new way of sensing color. When I was studying music, I realized that there's been many theories relating color and sound. Isaac Newton created this theory centuries ago, relating each color of the rainbow to a musical note. So I wanted to take Isaac Newton's theory into practice by creating a system that would allow me to hear the vibrations of color. Isaac Newton was right. Uh, there is a relationship between color and sound. Each color has a vibration, and this vibration relates to a musical note. Uh, but it's a note that we cannot hear because it vibrates too fast. So we created a system uh, in 2003 that allowed me to hear the vibrations of color. And the first prototype was uh, 16 years ago, and it was a webcam connected to a five kilo computer and a pair of headphones. And this allowed me to hear the vibration. So that was how I started to learn the sounds of color. So if we could hear color, this is how you would hear it. So red is this note between F and F sharp, and then it keeps going up. So it's very microtonal. So it took me months for me to learn the different notes of colors, but there was a point I was able to distinguish all the colors around me through the sounds that I kept hearing. So when I was able to distinguish all the visual spectrum, I didn't see why I should stop there, because there's many more colors that technology can sense, but that the human eye cannot sense, like infrareds and ultraviolets. So I decided to include infrareds and ultraviolets in the system as well. So I was able suddenly to sense more colors than humans. Sensing infrareds allows me to know if there's movement detectors in a room, so I can go to a shop or a bank and tell if the alarms are on or off, and in many cases they are off. So it's interesting to know that some of these sensors not, are not actually working. Also, ultraviolet perception allows me to know if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe. So if, if I sense there's a high level of ultraviolet, I avoid the sun or I just put some sun cream. So my aim is to continuously extend my color perception beyond the visual spectrum. So when I started the project, I didn't want to use technology or wear technology. I wanted to become technology. I wanted to create a new body part. First, I thought of creating a third eye that would be implanted in the middle of my forehead. But then I thought that this would limit my color perception to what I have in front. So then I thought that maybe it would be better to create a different type of organ, an antenna that would allow me to sense colors 360 degrees. So I started designing the antenna, and when the antenna was finished, the finished uh, the design, then I, I went to the doctor and I said I wanted an antenna implanted in my head. I showed him the antenna and then he said, sorry, we don't do antenna implants in this hospital. If you want to have this antenna implanted in your head, first of all, you'll have to convince a bioethical committee. So I presented the surgery to a bioethical committee 
and they said it was not ethical to have this antenna implanted in my head for three reasons. One, because it's not a pre-existing body part. If it was a leg or an arm, they would find it ethical. But they said an antenna is not human, so it's not ethical. The second reason is because it's not a pre-existing sense. Uh, sensing infrared and ultraviolet is not human, so they didn't find it ethical either. And the third reason is that they were very worried about the image the hospital would have if someone came out with an antenna sticking out of the head. So they said no to the surgery, but they helped me find a doctor willing to do the surgery anonymously. So we did the surgery uh, anonym with a non an anonymous doctor. This is my head facing down. My head was drilled four times, so I would have four different implants. One is this chip that now vibrates depending on the vibration of the color in front of me. So I feel the dominant color in front of me. This color enters the antenna and it vibrates inside my head. And this allows me to hear the vibration of color. The two other implants are to hold the structure of the new organ. And the fourth implant is internet connection. So I can also receive colors from other people. So people can send colors to my head via the internet. So the antenna and my head took two months to merge. So now the antenna is integrated in my skull. Um, so it took two months. So now this is part of my skeleton. So if someone tries to pull it, it's impossible because it's part of the uh, cranium. So it's part of my body. And I, I'm also officially taller now because this is part of my body. So I had to get used to the new height as well. So. Um, the internet connection, I have five people in the world that have permission to send colors to my head. It's five friends, and it, each friend is in one specific continent. So now I'm here in Brazil, but if there's an uh, interesting color in, uh, I don't know, in Japan, my friend from Japan can start streaming colors through his mobile phone to my head. So I could suddenly be sensing the colors of a supermarket in Japan, or I could be suddenly feeling the colors of a sunset in Europe. So. The internet allows me to receive colors from other parts of the world. So I see the internet as, as a sensory extension. And I think that in the future, we'll see how the internet will not only be used as a tool or a communication system, but also as a sensory extension or as a sense itself. Uh, also, if they send colors to my head when I'm sleeping, they wake me up sometimes, or they color my dreams. So if someone starts sending blue and I'm sleeping, my dream might suddenly become blue or the dream might take me to the sky or the, or the sea. So uh, my friends can not only color my dreams, but they can also alter my dreams if they send colors to my head when I'm sleeping. This, I see it as an AS project, not an AI project. If the antenna was artificial intelligence, the antenna would be telling me the names of colors, but this is not artificial intelligence. I see it as an artificial sense. The antennas allow me to sense color, and it's up to my brain to create the intelligence or not. So I think that in the future, we'll also see many more projects related to the creation of artificial senses, not only the creation of artificial intelligence. And the reality in which I live now is not a virtual reality, and it's not an augmented reality. I call it a revealed reality. Technology is allowing me to sense a reality that already exists. There's a lot of elements that now surround you that you cannot sense. There's uh, infrasounds, ultrasounds, ultraviolets. There's the magnetic north. There's uh, lots of elements that you cannot sense, but if you merge with technology, you can reveal this uh, reality. And this is a type of uh, exploration that I think we will see much more in the future, how by merging with technology, we can reveal things that already exist. This is an MRI scan of my brain, so I no longer feel the difference between the software and my brain, and that's why I identify myself as a cyborg, because I feel that I am technology, and this is what I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004, because they didn't allow me to renew my passport, because they said there was a problem with the photo. Apparently the norms, the rules say that if you have an electronic equipment, is, well, electronic equipments basically are not allowed on passport photos. I replied saying that this is not an electronic equipment. This is a body part. I told them that uh, I'm not wearing an antenna. I have an antenna in the same way that I'm not wearing a nose. I have a nose. And that I, this antenna should be considered a part of my body. After some months uh, of discussion, they finally accepted uh, the explanation. They allowed me to appear in the passport of 2004 with this uh, first antenna prototype and then the picture 
was renewed. I'm now in conversations with the Swedish government because all the materials that I used to create the antenna implant are Swedish, so I'm telling them that I am Swedish because a part of my body is Swedish, so I think that I should be allowed to become a Swedish citizen. If this happens, we might see that in the future some governments might regulate how many years you need to have an implant from a specific country in order to apply for being a citizen of that country. But if you have a, um, I don't know, a British body part for 20 years and you feel British, I think the government should allow you to become British. So we'll see what happens. I see all this as cyborg art, the art of designing your own senses, the art of designing your own body parts, and the art of designing your perception of reality. And there's a, this art, it's not only affecting the way I express myself, but also the way I do daily things like dressing myself if I want to dress uh, in a way that it sounds good, I can choose different colors. Uh, completely black is silent, but I can actually dress in C major. This is a C, E, and G, so it's Do, Mi, Sol. It's a major chord, so it sounds like a happy combination. I would dress like this in a funeral, because this is a minor chord. Or I can also design clothes that sounds like songs, so I can wear different melodies. This is a tie that I designed that sounds like electronic music, so when I look at it, I hear electronic music. So the longer the tie, the longer the music, so I can decide which songs I want to wear. Also, interior design has changed. I can now paint uh, houses so that they sound good. If I want a living room to sound C major, I will paint it pink, yellow, and blue. I like painting floors red, because red is a very deep uh, vibration, so it gives a profound sound to the whole house. Ceilings, are, it's nice to have them black and white because then it's silent. So if you lie down, you have some silence. Exit doors, it's good to have them green because green is in the middle of the spectrum. So it tunes yourself before you go out in the street. And uh, bedrooms, I like to have them in three colors. Turquoise, pink, and violet because it's a B, E, and D bed. So these three notes make sense to have them in the bedroom. And in the kitchen, I like to have violet, because violet is a high note. It's a color that we don't usually eat also, so it's a, a note that keeps you alert, and also it's a, a color that we don't eat, so it doesn't interfere with food. I really enjoy now composing music with food, because when I look at salads, for example, I hear different notes, so depending on how I put the food on the plate, I can eat a song, so I really enjoy just eating songs by putting the food on the plate in a specific order. I can also now compose music by looking at things. I don't need to play an instrument. This is an example of uh, music composition created by just looking at different colors. So my experience of walking around the supermarket has changed a lot. To me, it's just like going to a nightclub now, because in supermarkets there's lots of colors, so to me, there's lots of electronic music in supermarkets, especially the zone with cleaning products. That's the most exciting area of a supermarket because it has a very unexpected colors. It's not only supermarkets, it's changed also, uh, well, with, with, the, with, the, with the food we've done a project with a, with a, with a restaurant where in a way of sharing this is by creating a, a replica of the antenna on a plate. So this is a chroma phone where the food is placed on the plate and then customers can actually hear the music of the food and they can eat their favorite song. So you can go to this restaurant and then you can ask for Lady Gaga desserts or whatever music you want to eat. This is how it works. <laughs> Pero como cocinero nos abrió una, una ventana increíble. The other change is also the way I sense people's faces. So when I look at someone's face, I hear the face. So I like creating sound portraits where I get close to someone's face and then I write the sound of the eyes, the lips, the skin, the hair, and then I send them an MP3 of their face. One of the first sound portraits I did was of Prince Charles and I asked him if I could listen to his face and this was his reaction when I asked him. We all sound different uh, because we all have different sounds. James, uh, Prince Charles sounds almost C major. Judy Dench has silent hair because her hair is almost colorless. James Cameron has a very, very high-pitched sound of skin because his skin is almost a type of red that is very high-pitched. Al Gore has different notes in his eyes because he has different shades of turquoise. Um, I 
kalena siya. Uh, Steve Bosniak has uh, green eyes, so it's very pure green. It's uh, like a green apple. Robert De Niro has different shades of red in his lips, so he has a, a melody in his lips because it's different shades of uh, a color. Uh, Woody Allen sounds very soft, like an old painting, and Philip Glass sounds very microtonal, and Bono had very loud glasses here. Uh, so we all have specific soundscapes. What really shocked me through all these years is the people who say they're black, they're not black, and people who say they're white, they're not white. People who say they're black, they're actually very, very dark orange, and people who say they're white, they're actually very, very light orange. So the fact that people say that humans are black and white is completely false, we are all orange. <laughs> this is the human color wheel, which is in different shades of orange. Uh, obviously, if you wear makeup, it sounds very different. But sonochromatically, if you wear green lipstick, it sounds much better than red lipstick. So if you could hear color, uh, you would probably wear green lipstick because usually it sounds much better with uh, F sharp, which is the sound of the skin. This is the sound of, um, of a face. Albert II of Monaco, and he likes the sound of his face so much that he's using it as his ringtone. So whenever someone calls him, he hears the sound of his face. So when we started this project, we didn't know if there were, would be secondary effects, and there was one, which is basically that when I hear music or sounds, I also feel colors. So when I listen to music, each note that I hear, I feel a color. So um, this is an example of the colors that I feel. concerts for deaf people so that they can also experience the music, the vibrations of sounds, the vibrations of colors. So you can have a live concert transposed into color and then if you're completely deaf you can also experience it as a color. music can also be transposed into paintings. This is Queen of the Night, the song we just heard transposed into a painting. So this is a music score. And this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber, which looks very different from Mozart. So you can actually see the dominant color of musicians. Also, you can doing, by doing this, you can see the dominant color of people's voices. Because when we speak, we use different colors. These are two speeches. This is Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream. And this is a speech by Hitler. So it looks very different because they used very different frequencies when they spoke. Uh, we created an app so that you can use your mobile phone to listen to the sounds of color. It's a free app on Android, so using your camera you can actually hear the colors around you. And then we've created different public sculptures, so people download the app and if they walk underneath this sculpture they hear music. So this is actually music in the street uh, placed by color. And also at night the projection creates different colors that if you use your mobile phone you can actually hear the music created by the color projection. Also, this sound palette, I created it so that musicians can play colors as well. So I create color concerts, so musicians learn the sound of each color. And then on the day of the performance, there's no score. The score are the colors that are on the stage. So when we started this project, we didn't know what would happen. There were two risks. One was that my brain would reject the new sensory input. The second risk was that my head would reject the material of the antenna but it didn't happen. Both my brain and my he head accepted the material and the new sensory input, but the risk was that it would be rejected. What we were not expecting was the social reaction 
I've been stopped every single day in the street because people who see the antenna ask me what the antenna is or they point at me. So I've had to interact with strangers every single day for the last 15 years. And it's changed what people think. In 2004, most people thought it was a reading light. So people would ask me if I could turn on the light or they were wondering where my book was. In 2005, people thought it was a flexible microphone. In 2007, 2008, people thought it was a hands-free telephone, so they thought I was on the phone. In 2009, people thought it was a GoPro cam, that I was filming my life, so people were waving at me, thinking that I was filming them. In 2012, 13, many people thought I had something to do with Google Street View, and that I was streaming the streets. In 2015, many children would point at me and ask if this was some kind of selfie stick attached to my head. And in 2016, many people shouted at me, Pokemon, and they tried to catch me. <laughs> so it's changed what people think it is. It keeps changing. Hopefully, in the future, people will just think it's a new sensory organ, and we will see people in the street with new organs and new senses. In 2010, uh, eight years ago, we created the Cyborg Foundation with Moon Rivas in order to help people create their own senses. And we also defend the right to design ourselves. We've defended cyborg rights at South by Southwest and also at the European Union's commission uh, dedicated to robotic laws. So we're trying to fight the rights that we should all have to design ourselves. We should all be free to decide what senses and organs we want to have as a species. And uh, um, examples of people designing their own senses is Moon Rivas. She's done several projects. Uh, these are, for example, earrings that she had that allow her to feel movement without her eyes. So depending on the vibration, she would know if someone was walking from left to right, right to left. Depending on the interval, she would feel the exact speed. Also, by turning around the earrings, she would feel if someone was behind her. So this gave her retroception. Uh, we give this sense to cars, but we could also have these senses. Many cars can feel what's behind them. We could also feel what's behind us if we had these earrings that vibrate if there's presence behind you. She also has two implants in her feet that allow her to feel the seismic activity of the world. So whenever there's an earthquake in the world, she feels a vibration in her feet. So this gives her a second heartbeat. She has her own heartbeat and the earth beat because the earth keeps shaking every 10 minutes. She keeps feeling the earthquakes in her body. So this gives her a much closer relationship with earth than she had before. So it, it connects her with nature in a very deep level. She is now also connected to the seismograph of, on the moon, so she can also feel moon quakes. So whenever there's a, a seismic activity in the moon, she feels a vibration in her feet. So in the 20th century, we saw how humans went to the moon. Now in the 21st century, we can see how the moon comes into our own body. We see this as a way of exploring space. We can actually send our senses to space and explore space without having to physically go there. We call this becoming a sense-tronaut. And I think we'll see much more of this in the future, where instead of physically going to space, we can actually send senses to space and explore them without having to physically go there. I do this myself since 2014. I use my internet connection to explore the colors from space by connecting my antenna to NASA's International Space Station. When I do this, my sense of color is no longer on Earth, but in space. So this allows me to explore colors that uh, exist in space but that I never sense here on Earth. There's many ultraviolets that exist only in space and I never perceive here on Earth. Uh, another project we did is a tooth with a small light so that in case of emergency you can just click and then you have emergency light in your mouth. So this is called bioluminescence. There's many species that can create light in total darkness. So if you have a tooth missing you could have this tooth replaced with this uh, small LED in this fake tooth that allows you to create light in total darkness. I had it for a while, but the problem is that when I was eating, the light was going on and off all the time. So we're trying to find a system that will allow us to have this light without the clicks. Another project we did here in Brazil a few years ago uh, with Mesa in Cadeira in Sao Paulo was a, a tooth was placed inside my mouth and another tooth was placed inside Munriva's mouth. And then whenever I clicked, she received a vibration in her mouth, and whenever she clicked, I received a vibration in my mouth. And we, we both learned the Morse code, so depending on the, on the rhythm, we could actually send words to each other and communicate from mouth to mouth. So we call this the transdental communication system, 
and we demonstrated it in Sao Paulo and it worked. People were giving us words and we were sending them to each other and we were telling the audience what word it was. Uh, it's a system that works through Bluetooth, so it's actually a Bluetooth tooth that allows you to communicate from mouth to mouth. Just to end, the last project that I'm creating is the sense of time. We all have a sense of time, but we don't have an organ for the sense of time. So this will be an organ specifically to sense time, and it will be implanted between the skin and the bone, and it will be a point of heat that will slowly go around my head, and it will allow me to feel the 24-hour cycle of the planet in my body. I want my brain to get used to this, so maybe in a few years when my brain gets completely used to it, I will feel the pass of time perfectly, just like the rotation of the Earth. And whenever this happens, I want to see if I can change my perception of time. So if I want the situation to last longer, I'll make the point of heat go a bit slower, and then I should feel that time is stretching. Or if I want time to go faster, I'll make it go faster. So my aim is to take Albert Einstein's theory of time relativity into practice and see whether or not we can modify our perception of time if we have an organ for the sense of time. I think it will be possible, because in the same way that we can create optical illusions because we have an organ for the sense of sight, if we have an organ for the sense of time, we'll be able to create time illusions. So we'll be able to decide if we want a situation to last longer or less longer, and eventually we could also change our own perception of age. So if you want to live 200 years or 250 years, there's two options. One is you can try to make your body live 200 years, uh, or the other option is to make your mind believe that you've lived 200 years. I'm gonna try this second uh, option, and I'm gonna make, uh, try to make this new organ control my perception of time so that I can decide how many years I want to feel that I've lived. This is another artist, uh, Manel Muñoz. He's sitting here and he has a, an organ that allows him to sense the weather. So he can actually feel if it's going to rain or if it's going to be sunny. He can feel the pressure of the atmosphere in his head and he's developing further so he will become a weather station uh, and a, literally a weatherman because he will feel the weather in his head. Together with him and with Moon Rivas, we created the Transpecies Society. It's an association in Barcelona that gives voice to non-human identities. There's many people who, by merging with technology, feel less human, uh, feel more trans-species because they've added senses and organs that are not traditional humans. So we're giving voice to these uh, people and also we are creating new senses and new organs in community. So just to end, I think we are in a very special moment in history where we can decide what species we want to be. We have the technology now that will allow us to decide what senses and organs we want to have. Very soon this will not be mechanic or it won't be electronic. We'll be able to 3D print these organs with our own DNA. So this antenna at some point will be 3D printed with my own DNA so it will be organic. And I'll be able to add senses by genetically modifying myself. So by doing this, we will slowly be able to truly decide what species we want to be. And I think we should see this as something good. We've been for thousands of years designing the planet and changing the planet in order to survive, and I think this is wrong. Instead of creating artificial light, we should create night vision so that we don't need to spend so much energy creating artificial light. If we all had night visions, these this, uh, lights would be off. All the city of Rio would have no lights, and we would, wouldn't be spending so much energy creating this artificial light. The planet should be dark when it's dark, when it's night. We shouldn't have uh, artificial light. If we could also control our own temperature, we wouldn't use heaters when it's cold, and we wouldn't use air conditioning when it's hot. We wouldn't change the temperature of the planet. So if we can design these organs that allow us to control our own temperature, it will be much better for the environment. We won't have to change the planet in order to survive and live better. So I think that slowly society will see it ethical that the more we design ourselves, but the better it will be for the planet, for ourselves, and also for other species. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. I'm going to ask you to stay with me on stage a little quick. I have a few questions for you. In fact, a lot of questions for you. I'm going to do the questions in Portuguese, and I'm going to translate to you, OK? O que você acha, uma pergunta anônima, o que você acha de usar a tecnologia para permitir que humanos tenham superpoderes? Existe um limite ético nisso? 
Um, uh, the word superpower is usually misused, I think, because uh, many things that we think are superpowers are not superpowers. Uh, like many people think that this, for example, sensing ultraviolet and infrared is a superpower, but it's not. It, there's so many species in this planet sensing infrared and ultraviolet. It's such a normal thing. Also, uh, sensing through bone conduction is something that dolphins do. Uh, sensing pressure in such a way is something that many species, species do. So. Uh, what we do is we get inspired by senses and organs that already exist in nature and we try to adapt them to the human body uh, via technology, but uh, it's really difficult to find something that is supernatural because when you look at nature you will find that there are species with senses and organs that are extraordinary and each year new discoveries are made of senses that species have. So the inspiration uh, of the cyborg Foundation and uh, Transpecies Society comes from observing other species. It doesn't come from science fiction or from technology itself. And I think the limits should be personal to each person. I think the, the limits that one gives to oneself are very personal. Nossa próxima pergunta é de Léo Correia. Levante a mão para saber você está aí. Sua, sua antena é um dispositivo de input. Você já pensou sobre dispositivos de output, transmitir estados de humor como fome, cansaço ou algo assim? Um, I guess no, because if if you want to know if you're tired, you should listen to yourself. Many of the uh, technology or wearables that already exist are designed as outputs, so uh, implants that allow you to know your blood pressure or your uh, sugar in the blood. So many of the implants that exist are created as an output, uh, and usually they're done by medical teams. What we do is the opposite. So we only create inputs. We like to use technology as a way of uh, receiving things from the outside. So I don't think we will focus on technology as an output. We will continue to focus on the creation of technology as an input from the outside to the body. Ok. Nossa próxima pergunta é anônima. Como que a Cyborg Foundation se posiciona com relação a implantes ou algum tipo de junção neural direto com computadores? Como fica a segurança da privacidade? Yeah, this is one of the issues uh, that we talk about at, at the cyborg rights. So there's lots of laws that do not regulate all this. And in my case, and in Manel's case, and Moon's case, we have internet in our bodies. So we are easily hacked. We can be hacked, basically, physically hacked. Through all these years, I've only been hacked once. So someone without permission started sending colors to my head, and it wasn't one of the five people that had permission. So I was physically hacked once. But I actually liked it. It was a good experience because it was uh, a surprise to receive colors from someone that I have no idea who it is. But if this became a problem, then there are ways of cutting the internet connection. So there's ways of stopping the internet or making all this much more secure. But yes, there's no uh, regulation. Uh, the, this case of being physically hacked should be treated as physical aggression but now uh, it won't be treated as physical aggression. It will be treated as some kind of um, basically technological um, misuse, basically. Or also if some, right, sometime somebody pulls the antenna, for example, this will be treated as um, uh, damaging property, uh, whereas I think it should be treated as physical aggression. So these are things that might be changing in the next years, how uh, laws might change the way we treat technology, and technology will slowly be treated more as a body part or a part of our mind, not only something external. But yes, yeah, some people try to pull the antenna. It's usually drunk women, so I try to avoid <laughs> drunk women, basically. <laughs> Próxima pergunta de Ariel. Está lá o Ariel. Você não se sente overstimulated às vezes? At the beginning, when you add a new sense, it is overstimulating, but the brain slowly adapts this new sense as normal. So it, there are some moments where you need to adapt to the new input, and then the brain will slowly feel it's normal. But now it's completely normal. I've been hearing colors for 
15 years, so it's completely normal for me to be perceiving colors in such a way. Ok. Próxima pergunta também é anônima. Bem interessante. Alguns místicos já afirmaram que temos centros energéticos que vibram e têm uma cor relacionada. Você já questionou isso? That we have parts of the body vibrating? Exatamente. Centros energéticos que vibram e yes. têm uma cor relacionada a esse centro energético. Yes, so that like the chakras or I guess yes, so we do uh, uh, create energy and this energy vibrates in a specific way and this vibration can be related to a specific color or to a specific uh, note as well. Uh, the antenna allows me to sense infrared, which is already uh, the beginning of this uh, heat that the body uh, emits and at some points I can feel the vibration of the heat of the body. So. And I hear it as a, as a note and as a color, which is infrared. Uh, if I amplify the infrareds further, then there will be a way of actually identifying the different types of energy that a body emits. And this can be classified as different types of infrared, which are different types of color and also different notes. Uh, but yeah, I've met many people because I've, I've been with the color mm, world for many years, so I've met people that with a pendle they can actually detect the vibrations of the energy of the body, and I truly believe this is, this is not uh, fantasy, this is something physically true. We emit energy, and the energy is not always the same, it varies, and therefore it can be um, classified as different colors. Yes. Muito bem, a próxima pergunta é de Yuri. Dentro da Transpice Society, quais são as intervenções mais disruptivas, na sua opinião? Um, the ones that we cannot talk about, I guess. There's many <laughs> of them that we cannot actually mention because people who are doing them, they don't want to be known. So that we do things that are still not known, but maybe in the 2020s or in the 2030s, in 10 or 15 years, we will talk about what we did in the 2010s, but now we can talk about these examples because we uh, like to share them, but there's many people who are not willing to share the organs and senses that they are implanting uh, in the Transpecies Society or in the Cyber Foundation. And there's also a network of doctors willing to do these surgeries anonymously, in the same way that transgender surgeries were not allowed in the 1950s and 60s in many countries, but there were a network of doctors doing these surgeries in Denmark, for example, there were doctors doing these surgeries anonymously. Now it's happening the same with transspecies surgeries. There is a network of doctors willing to do these surgeries anonymously, and it's happening, but it's still not all publicly expressed. Você escuta música ou som o tempo todo ou consegue silenciar quando você quer? I can cover it, like I can cover my ears or I can cover my eyes, but there's no switch because all our senses are always on, so I didn't design a switch, it's always on. And if I don't want to cover it, I just close it. Or if I turn off the lights, then it's completely silent because there's no color usually. Considerando que a antena está implantada na sua cabeça, como funciona a manutenção? Well, the antenna keeps evolving during my life, because technology keeps evolving, my body keeps evolving. So that's the advantage of being a cyborg, that you can look at aging as a good thing. The older I get, the better my senses can be, or the better my body can be, because you keep evolving with technology. And the antenna has evolved since 2004. In 2004, I could only sense the visual spectrum. 2007-8, I added infrared and ultraviolet. Uh, in 2012, I added the internet, so it keeps evolving, and also the physical antenna, I've changed the tips of the antenna several times, but the implant can also be upgraded through, from the outside, because it has internet, so you can upgrade the implant without having to open and close the head, basically. Se você sente as cores, as sensações diferem de acordo com cada cor? 
well, the sensations or the feelings that I have for color don't relate to the social ones, I guess. For me, red, for example, is a peaceful color because red is the lowest frequency of light. Red is a very low frequency color. It's a very deep sound, very um, peaceful sound. It's not uh, as aggressive as violet. Violet is an aggressive color because it travels at a very high uh, frequency so fast that it can actually, uh, if it goes beyond, it's ultraviolet, which can actually kill you. It can go through the skin and it can actually kill you. So to me, traffic lights would be violet at the top, not red, because red is a peaceful color. And uh, green, for example, is very neutral. Green is in the middle of the spectrum. So to me, green is neutral. Violet is aggressive, passionate, uh, very alive. Red is extremely peaceful. E a última questão, pergunta, porque não temos mais tempo, infelizmente eu tenho centenas de perguntas aqui ainda, mas não temos mais tempo. Falamos sempre em como a tecnologia pode nos melhorar biologicamente, mas quais são os riscos desse futuro? Well, the risks are uh, the aim in my case is not to improve myself my aim is to explore and it's to explore nature to explore uh, the planet to explore uh, also the senses so the aim is is to discover the planet to rediscover the planet by adding new senses and is to uh, reveal a reality that exists in our planet that but that we've never felt or sensed so i guess our great great grandparents had the chance of discovering new parts of the world, like going to the North Pole was new, or climbing the, the Everest was something new, but, or going to space was something new, but this has already been done. What we, our generation in the 21st century, can start doing is to discover the planet, not by going to places, but by adding new senses. If you add ultraviolet perception, uh, Rio will be different. You will sense your city in a very different way because there will be zones with lots of ultraviolet, zones with lots of infrared, so you will rediscover your own city by adding new senses. And that's what I think we will start doing. Many people will start adding these senses to discover uh, and to... And I think, what was the... I, I, maybe I went, what was the question actually? I, what was... Uh, if, if there's a limit or... That's right. Was this the, if there's a limit? Risks. Ah, risks. I guess the risk is the same risks that climbing the Everest or going to, uh, there is a risk. Uh, it's uh, an art that has a risk. There's many sports that have risk. Many, many, many sports have lots of risk and people do them. So this is a type of uh, art or discipline that has a risk. You can die, you, you can have an infection and you can die or you can have secondary effects that we have no idea uh, that can happen, but there are, there's always this uh, uh, thing that goes beyond the risk, which is the curiosity of discovering things and of reaching places that we've never reached. And that's, uh, I think, goes much beyond the fear of the risk that one might have by adding new senses. Okay, I'm going to ask you to leave some final message, thoughts, remarks. <laughs> Um, I don't know, final remarks. Um, I guess I, I would like, maybe you should question yourself if you want to live the rest of your life with the same senses and the same organs. Just, it's good to question this. Uh, I think now we can have, we can question ourselves if we want to continue our lives with the same senses and the same organs. Just maybe it's a question that it's, might help. I, I don't know, it might be. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything else to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you said a lot. Thank okay. you so much. <laughs>